I'm actually not used to holding a mic um, without singing, so. <laughs> and since I can't sing, this is dangerous here. Um, okay, so here's, um, this is what I want to talk about tonight. It's only a guess, but an educated guess. Okay, so this is a little scary for those of us in the mental health community, clinicians, prescribers, um, but in terms of our understanding of how we treat depression, particularly for uh, prescribers, nurse practitioners, and psychiatrists, the scary part of this discussion is it's only a guess, but an educated guess. And, and that's kind of what I want to share with you, the hype and the hope that I believe we can do a better job treating depression. I know we can do a better job treating depression as a, a community. And um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of what I've been doing for the past 25 years. And I use the term integrative medicine. And let's, let's start. I'm going to, how much time do we have? What's the plan? Eight, eight o'clock, we're done. So we'll, um, yeah, I want to leave enough time for questions. Interrupt me if it's specific to the slide, but I will make sure that we make this interactive and uh, deal with questions. So uh, pay here, our treatment of depression is pretty much driven by the pharmaceutical industry, and that has both good and bad news. Ask your doctor if placebos are right for you. How many people have seen the commercials for Abilify, Latuda, Seroquel, Cymbalta? Okay, the scary part is how many people think those commercials influence the prescribing practices? Well, well they do. It's scary how much they do. So let's just look, about, look at this for a minute. First of all, I had to show this. So is that, um, in Toronto, the American Psychiatric Association, and I took the escalator. It was a big convention hall, four floors, and every escalator had a different drug ad on the handle. Okay, so that was pretty obvious and easy to see. But what this picture doesn't capture, when there was an up and down escalator, in between the two, there were more drug ads. So a lot of people didn't always look down, right? You just look up, you go, but then you look down, you see, oh, there's another ad. So not only are we advertising to our prescribers, but we're advertising to consumers. And the United States, and I think New Zealand, is only one other country in the world that allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise to consumers. And it affects our practices. So in one study, 15 non-depressed people received medications for every depressed people. This is a study for physicians. 24% of physicians, a quarter of MDs polled, said that it affected their prescribing practice, right? Susie walks into your office, saw the commercial, I want to try this medicine. One quarter and 73% of primary care um, Physicians felt pressured to prescribe the medication based on the cartoons, right? All the early ones were, were cartoons um, that we see on TV. That I sit there with my 14-year-old daughter, and they talk about the medicine, and most of the commercial is the side effects, right? Seizures and death. <laughs> and it's a little scary. But the pharmaceutical world does control a big part. And, and here's... Um, the theory for tonight that hopefully I'll talk to you about, I think we can do better. This is just one study on antidepressants, and we're going to focus on depression. Most of our talks at Walden over the years have been on eating disorders, but tonight we're really going to just focus on the treatment of unipolar depression. So one study, 2014, 1,800 individuals on antidepressants, 60% felt emotionally numb, right? You've heard the story. I go to the movie theater, it's a sad movie, I used to cry, I can't cry anymore. Uh, recently I heard I was at a funeral of a loved one and I couldn't cry. It's emotionally numb. 62% report sexual difficulty. 
reduction in positive feelings, caring less about others, 55% had, had withdrawal. This is from a study, I think anybody who prescribes and asks the questions, the sexual side effects are 80 to 90%. The feeling emotionally numb, 80 to 90%. These medications profoundly affect how we interact with the world, and my concern for our youth is falling in love, right? What does it take to fall in love? Well, you can't be emotionally numb, have sexual difficulties, not feel good about others, right? So this kind of increased use of antidepressant medications with the lack of efficacy I'll talk about, I think has profound cultural effects on, on who we are as a society. So the research over the past 20 years has been available telling us these medications don't work as well, right? You've heard that. And you've heard the placebo response works as well as these medications. How, how many, what, what percentage of individuals respond to placebo who've been um, treated for depression? Just here. 50%. Pretty close, right? 45 to 50% of our patients with unipolar depression, if you gave them a M and M pill, and you told them that M, do they still have an M on the, if you told them that M was for mood enhancement, that they would feel better. And that's to mild to moderate depression, over half. So a community got hold of that literature, and then a more disturbing literature is the pharmaceutical companies withholding studies Right? For years, we thought these antidepressants worked 90% of the time. Well, they only work 90% of the time because those are the studies that the drug companies let the community see. But the hidden studies came out about 15 years ago, and we get this kind of 50% response. So there are people that pick at the American Psychiatric Association and their websites, and it's kind of toxic psychiatry and psychiatry kills. And how many people have heard of Peter Bregan? Well, he's a psychiatrist who's written a number of books and he's got websites and drugs are evil. So people read his book and they stop their medications quickly and they feel miserable and um, it's sometimes pretty dangerous. And I guess the, the word that I hope to communicate tonight and hopefully we'll have a discussion is that you know, we can spend all of our time blaming meds or psychiatrists um, but it doesn't offer the patients sitting in front of us who have struggled with depression um, or our adolescents who are cutting and trying to commit suicide. It doesn't provide answers. And what I want to begin to discuss tonight is I think that the concept of integrative medicine does provide some answers for our patients struggling with depression. So integrative medicine, which means I have my prescription pad on one side of my desk, and I have a couple of vitamin bottles on the other side of my desk. Um, there's, we use whatever we can to help our patients, so it's a comprehensive approach. So here's a quote from, this was the um, chancellor at Duke University, talking about, we have a sick system, the integrative approach flips the system on the head, puts patients at the center addressing not just symptoms, but the cause of the disease. Okay, it is care that is preventative, predictive, and personalized. And that's really the goal when I see a patient for the treatment of depression. Can we understand any underlying biological or genetic causes? We're, we're all quite aware after our interviews of some of the psychological life stressors that have created some of the um, symptoms. In, in front of us, but other biological kind of genetic vulnerabilities that we can treat. And there's actually a, you know, group. It's called P4 Medicine Institute. Started by a, a physician um, talking about these concepts. So integrative medicine. So let's try to understand the problem that we've received, why we're in this problem, and why psychiatry is so different. And part of it is that our medical colleagues have objective tests to help us make a diagnosis and determine in treatment, right? What does your 
primary care physician do if you have a cough? Anybody? I'm sorry? So we might get a chest x-ray, might get a blood test, we might get an MRI. We certainly will take out a stethoscope and listen. And who knows all the other tests that we have in the rest of Menon. But we have these biological markers where we can look and see what might be contributing to that cough, right? Because a lung cancer is different than that pneumonia, right? So what do our psychiatry colleagues do to make a diagnosis? <laughs> right? I mean, we ask a bunch of questions. And we get our crystal ball. And that list of answers to those questions, we come up with a diagnosis. And it's a diagnosis based on a list of symptoms, right? So our colleagues in medicine, they're going to have that cough. They're going to measure the physiology. They're going to taste the chest x-ray. And guess what? Their treatment is going to be based on what they find, right? Lung cancer goes to the oncologist, and they're going to do X, Y, and Z. And it's amazing. It's sad, though, when you know someone's ill or you're ill, but the medical system, with all its faults, it's a logical progression. And our friends and colleagues and family who are depressed, what do you get? You get an antidepressant medication, an anti-symptom medication. It has no relationship to what might be causing the depression, whether it's trauma, or whether it's pancreatic cancer, whether it's a hormone deficiency or B12 or any of the other things we might be talking about. But everybody with the same list of symptoms gets the same treatment. Now, am I the only one that thinks that's absurd? Well, I mean, not only is it logically absurd, it hasn't worked very well for us. It hasn't worked, and that's why these studies, the efficacy of antidepressants are getting scarier and scarier because it's at 50%, and the placebo response actually is getting higher and higher over the years. So we got ourselves into trouble because it's all symptom-based, so we start going down this polypharmacy highway, right? Do you see the, um, and that keeps going, right? Buspar, Wellbutrin. And it's a polypharmacy highway without any navigation system. And we have these tremendously high relapse rate. We have suicide. And the scariest um, that we deal with is this residual symptom. Over 2 thirds of our patients treated with antidepressants still have symptoms. How many people with left lower lobe pneumonia still has pneumonia you know, two weeks later? I mean, our, we wouldn't tolerate that as a physician. But we tolerate sexual side effects, sleep side effects, um, mood problems. Two thirds of those treated with antidepressants have residual symptoms. OK, I better stop psychiatry bashing and, and go to the, the new model. And this is the integrative approach that I hope to share with you that will be starting in our Hingham Clinic that we've been doing in, in Waltham for many years. You know, can we get to this underlying um, symptom picture? Can we understand what might be contributing to the depression? So we do lots of tests. We look at urine, hair, blood, saliva, and we test, and we find out, is something going on? And oftentimes, we find relevant um, stuff. OK, a simpler way of looking at it, I, I think that um, a model that's easy to remember is when we're treating depression. The integrative medicine approach to treatment is, is the name doesn't matter because we know the names are just made up, right? The DSM is just a list of names that don't have no bearing of what might be causing it. But if we think about someone having these list of symptoms and we're asking two questions when anybody walks in the office, is there something the patient 
is deficient in. There's something they need. And that could be vitamin deficiencies, mineral deficiencies, hormones. It could be light. It could be emotional connections or, or love. And is there something that patient needs to avoid? I hate the word toxic, but anyways, is there something negative that's getting in the way? Is there an allergy, right? Or is there heavy metals? Is there molds? Is there yeast? Is there bacteria? Is there mercury? Whatever the list is. So it's a simple concept. Is there something that they're deficient in? Is there something that is toxic? Pretty simple, right? Make sense? So the, the book on depression that we wrote, we tried to articulate how you can begin to understand some of these physiological factors that contribute to depression. And we used the mnemonic, the zebra. Because I kind of been a little obsessed with zebras for a long time. And um, anyone know why I chose zebras? What? Black and white. No, I'm not that black and white. Most people would say I'm kind of gray. Um, but zebras, at least I heard as a kid, and I found out it was true, that they all have a unique stripe pattern. Have you heard that one? OK, so every zebra on the planet has a unique stripe pattern, just like our fingerprints are unique. And the whole core present you know, of, of the book and what I will share with you is we need to understand what's going on for the individual sitting in front of us or our family member. And we use the mnemonic, the zebra, and these are the kinds of things we look for. Um, take care of yourself would be looking at um, things like stress, diet, sleep, hormones. What hormones contribute to depression? Thyroid, testosterone, estrogen, all our hormones. How many psychiatrists look at your thyroid function before they prescribe a pill? Anybody? I have a zero. Zero. So it's just not common. And it was actually more common 20 years ago during training. But hormones cause depression. Low testosterone in men cause fatigue and depression. Low thyroid in women or men or adolescents cause all that same list of symptoms in the DSM that says depression that we're just handing a prescription of Prozac for. We're going to talk a little bit about exclude and trace minerals and fats and vitamins and um, microorganisms in the gut. There's lots to talk about. And we're going to start off with talking about protein and amino acids as one of the factors that contribute to depression. Okay. When we talk about medications, right? Antidepressants or any medication that we see on TV or that our prescribed is used, they all do the same thing, right? They affect these chemicals in the brain that we call neurotransmitters. You heard that term? And all these neurotransmitters, they're proteins, but the amount of these neurotransmitters that are synthesized are based on these precursors that we got from your diet. So we've heard of all these kinds of theories of depression, neurotrans, serotonin deficiency, and we really haven't proven that. But there's clearly neurotransmitter dysfunction. Something's not right. I didn't do it. Well, luckily, I brought my little slide on. So where's Deborah? She made up for, uh, let's see. OK, so neurotransmitters are made from protein. And where do we get that protein? from our diet, OK? And what are, what are foods that have protein in it? Meats, fish, eggs, chicken, etc. OK. So I'm going to talk about Marsha. So Marsha was a, um, 30, when we saw her, she was a 36-year-old woman. She had um, not a great childhood. 
and long history of therapy, trials of medication that didn't work, over time became a very, very successful businesswoman and, and life was pretty good. She was very concerned about her health, so she did her yoga classes and she flew her salmon in from Alaska and she, what else did she do? Oh, her organic rice and kale. I mean, she was very concerned about her health. And she started um, getting, she had a little stress at work, started becoming increasingly depressed and anxious and not feeling well. So she went to her primary care doctor. And what did her primary care doctor do? Oh, you guys are good, okay. Put her on antidepressant. And what antidepressant did they put her on if this was like seven years ago? Close. Lex, oh, who did the Lexapro? Thank you. And why Lexapro? Why? Just come out. And what was in the closet? Samples. Okay, so now we're getting it. So she was put on Lexapro. Um, and what happened when she came back two weeks later? Well, she might have, but I don't know about that. But she came back to the PCP and um, she wasn't feeling any better. So he did, no, he was, this is a PCP. He watches TV. <laughs> Abilify came out, right? So, uh, and wasn't Abilify the cartoon with the little black cloud? And if you take Abilify, your black cloud goes away. So he said, wow, I could take away her black cloud. So he added Abilify, and he added Ativan. Okay, these are true stories. So she's on Lexapro, Abilify, Ativan, and um, her, thank you. You know, she feels terrible, and then she, um, I feel worse, and she's sent to the psychiatrist. So what did, you guys are so good. What did the psychiatrist do? Now, didn't hospitalize her yet. So he said the SSRI is not working, so might as well add Welbutrin, right? It works a little differently. And there's a little out of sequence. So there was another visit. This was not just four weeks. This was probably eight or 12 weeks. But then she was irritated and agitated, so she must be bipolar. <laughs> so we got to give her Lamictal. Okay, so she came to see me on five medications and she wasn't feeling any better, okay? And, and you know, I use Marsha as an example. You guys didn't see the first slide because she was so concerned about her health and diet that dietary intake doesn't always reflect what we start finding when we investigate what's happening in your body. Okay, she was trying really hard. So we do this battery of tests, and one of the tests that we do, we do many, many, is looking at levels of fasting amino acids. Because these amino acids are the precursors to protein, which are the precursors to what? The neurotransmitters. Your body doesn't make these. You have to obtain them from your diet. So take a minute to think of our vegan, 16-year-old who's only eating pasta and chips and Coke and is growing, supposedly, and trying brain development, go through puberty, think about what their neurotransmitters levels are like. Okay, protein is critical. So if you see here, if th this is kind of normal over here, all these essential amino acids were very, very low. So she was eating her organic chicken and salmon from Alaska, but she was not absorbing and digesting it. Okay? So the interventions, first of all, we started slowly tapering the medications, the Abilify, etc. but over a period of time. But the interventions was giving her a powder of free form amino acids. Now, not a protein powder that you go to the, the health food store and get, because that's like the chicken and fish, your body has to break it down. These are just the amino acids. It has all the essential amino acids. And then we gave her the enzyme to help her digest this wonderful, healthy food that she's eating. 
she's wasting all this money. She says, might as well digest it. So we gave her this digestive enzyme with acid to help her digest it. Significant improvement in two weeks and four weeks back to herself. Okay? She was profoundly deficient in essential amino acids with all protein in the body is dependent on and certainly the neurotransmitters. So one of the simplest interventions, particularly for those over 40, is um, we start to lose our ability to make hydrochloric acid. And, um, let me just, and it interferes with digestion. And here are some of the reasons why individuals might be low. And I, I'm going to keep repeating the same story, which is 10 individuals. Let's take 36-year-old um, women, uh, Marsha's age. We might get 10 different biochemical profiles. Okay? Marsha had low amino acids. Other reasons why someone might be low in amino acids certainly is uh, the vegan, vegetarian we talked about. I'm not having enough digestive enzymes. And then my favorite we'll talk about here is our obsession with antacids. How many people know, do you know anybody that's not taking the antacid? Anybody over 60? We're now putting our one to two month olds on antacids. If we have anybody with GI symptoms, a pediatric gastrologist, everybody's on antacids you stop the production of acid and you can't absorb nutrients. B12, folate, and guess what? Amino acids. So digestion is important. And the other thing which I think is important with Marsha is stress, right? Chronic stress, trauma, old trauma, our body in this fight or flight response, we kind of shut off our digestive system we put our energy to, to run. And, and for those people under chronic trauma, we've just found that their digestion is chronically impaired. So no matter how healthy they're eating, their digestive system is impaired. So there's lots of reasons why individuals might be low. Um, and there's clearly been many uh, lawsuits on the um, antacids, um, certainly for things like um, fractures, not with mental health at this point. Okay, so first concept when we talk about understanding depression is making sure someone's digesting the protein, having adequate protein, and providing it the enzymes if they don't. But there are also ways that we can use the amino acids, the essential amino acids, to help an individual struggling with depression. So remember we talked about these amino acid precursors. Well, tryptophan is found in what? Turkey. What else? I'm sorry? It's all protein, but certainly turkey and milk, right? A glass of milk before bed. And tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. And we've known for years, since the 70s, if you increase tryptophan in your diet, you're going to make more serotonin. If you decrease tryptophan, you're going to decrease serotonin. And guess what? That's how we study depression. We take monkeys and we take women. There's been no research on men. Okay? We deplete women in the lab of tryptophan. And we use that as a model for irritability, depression, PMS. I have not seen a study with males. We have animal studies. Oh, look. Here's our chimpanzees. But, but it, it's, our, it's our model for depression. Low, less serotonin, more irritability, more depression. So one of the um, things that we use is amino acids, you know, the precursor amino acids to treat depression. It's just simple. It's common sense. There's very little research to support it because there's no pharmaceutical. So let me just um, go back here. And, and this is just kind of a, of a sample of, of the, the work. And for those non-biochemists uh, in the room, I apologize. But I want to make it simple. Right? We've talked about serotonin as a neurotransmitter that's helpful for depression. Most of the psychotropic medicines increase serotonin, right? Prozac, SSRI. 
How many people know that serotonin is the precursor to melatonin? What do you need melatonin for? Help you sleep. If you don't have adequate serotonin, you're not going to sleep well. Remember our tryptophan from Turkey? We already discussed without ad adequate tryptophan, you're not going to do this. But here's the other part of the equation are all these vitamins and minerals. It, it's not that simple, and that's why some of my colleagues or integrative doctors or holistic doctors say, well, just take tryptophan, it's going to cure your depression. Well, I, I wish it was that simple. We would all feel better. But I'm going to talk to you about these genetic defects in folate and B6 and zinc that contribute to making the serotonin and melatonin so things work optimally. Okay? So the in field of psychopharmacology dramatically changed with listening to Prozac. Where was I think it was in the 80s, right? If we kept serotonin around longer, we improved mood. And for many patients, it was incredibly helpful. But here's just a summary of um, my concept of psychiatry redefined. There are other ways that we can increase the synthesis and efficacy of that chemical serotonin without sexual side effects, right? We can um, increase protein. We can use the amino acids, and we're going to talk about zinc, folate, magnesium, etc. There are many, many other ways. And then the piece that has been an important part of our practice is genetics. Our ability to synthesize serotonin, to break it down, to take it back up, are all dependent on these variations of genes that we all have. Okay? And it's really important that we understand it. And it's a simple test, a little cheek swab, that we do on every patient that we see now because it has dramatically saved people time, money, and anguish taking the wrong medications. So how many people have heard of the genetic tests? A couple of you. Um, so there's something called single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a big term, but we can just use the word SNPs. And we all have these, and there's thousands of SNPs, and that's our little you know, chromosome, our DNA strand. And we look at a change in just one of these. And, and here's a, a simple an example. This normal gene produces an enzyme and the perfect shape. And here's this little tiny mutation that nobody can see and nobody might know for many years, but it's a slightly altered shape. So the protein, the enzyme, the nutrient just doesn't work as efficiently. Okay? So think about it. How we break down these neurotransmitters, serotonin or dopamine, we can have these unique combinations. So one of the most important little genetic tests that I've found over the past few years is this serotonin transporter gene. Right? You do a little cheek swab, and there are different, three different variations of this gene. I can't tell from looking at anybody whether they have it, but the three variations, everybody is walking and talking and might be feeling fine. But it tells us these two variations about how you uptake or transport serotonin. And it also predicts how you respond to SSRIs. How you respond to Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil, or Lexapro. So it kills me as a clinician and now knowing that we have this test, to see patients, and I saw one today, who had trials of three or four, this is an adolescent, three or four of the same class of antidepressant medications, SSRIs. Now one, maybe two, but why would you try four? None of them worked, and they all had side effects, and then we did this genetic test, and they had this serotonin transporter gene. If this test was done two years ago, she wouldn't have been on an SSRI would have been another kind of antidepressant. 
And here's just one of example of how the, the few studies done is that same serotonin transporter gene is able to predict kind of emotional eating, which is kind of the beginning of that binge eating in young adolescent girls. It is also a gene that predicts higher risk for PTSD. So these genetic markers are a very, very important part of understanding who we are as individuals, and it's a really important determinant of how we can treat an individual patient. Remember, preventative, predictive, and personalized. And we're going to keep coming back to personalized medicine. So here's, here's the genetic test, um, some of the 10 markers that we look at. So I'm going to go through some of the next slides quickly, but another um, very important nutrient and genetic marker that we test for in everybody is folic acid. I was in medical school and I did a research paper with someone on folic acid and depression. So that was a few years ago. We've had this information. We know if you're low in this nutrient, you have a higher risk for depression, you have a poor response to the medication, and you have a higher relapse rate if you get better. So wouldn't you want to know those things before? And wouldn't we want our patients to know those things? Well, it took 30 years, but finally, um, we actually have a pharmaceutical drug that is high dose folate. How many people have heard of Deflin? A couple of you. So it's a pharmaceutical high dose folic acid supplement based on 30 years of research saying that folate is critical to make those neurotransmitters and we have different genetic variations. How many people have read or heard about the MTHFR gene? A few of you. So that's our test if you have poor metabolism of folate. So MTHFR. So there's, again, remember the three variants for the serotonin transporter? We have three variants for this. We have CT, TT, and CC. The normal is CC, but if you notice the normal here, CT is the vast majority of us. The information I think that's important is T is for trouble. Okay, the T variant just means that you have a harder time converting this nutrient folic to the, the, the form that crosses the blood-brain barrier to make these neurotransmitters. And again, we have many, many years of research that if you have a T, you have a much, much higher incidence of getting depression. Here we go. So if you have the TT, you're twice the risk of getting depression. If you have a CT, you're kind of one and a half times the risk of getting depression. One of the things that's been clear to me in looking at this test for a number of years, those individuals that have this CT, or particularly the TT variant, are typically what we call treatment refractory. They don't respond as well to our medications, our psychotherapy models. So we need to do a lot more. These are the patients on the inpatient unit. These are the patients in, in multiple levels of care that just aren't getting better. And we do this test and they have this TT variant. Okay, it's complicated um, how important it is, but the punchline is it's a simple test and a simple intervention. And I thought this is so dramatic, I just wanted to repeat it again, relapse rate. Okay, Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, 10 years ago. 28 weeks of Prozac, 40 milligrams a day. They did a simple blood test, and if you had low folate in this blood test that cost pennies, you had almost 42% or 50% chance of relapse. And, and one of the hardest part of, I think, our profession, for those of you professionals, is that kind of chronic relapsing course of this illness when patients start to do better and you feel good and they feel good and six months or nine months later they're in another major depression. Look at this for a vitamin pill that literally costs pennies. 42% versus those that had normal folate was only 3.2%. So it's 
So wouldn't we want to look at folate levels if we treat someone with depression? Well, I would. Um, one of the other kind of, um, I believe, most important nutrients that we um, have not done a good job testing is this B12 level. It's a simple blood test. And when I was in training 25, maybe 30 years ago, we won't say, it was, um, it was routine, right? B12 folate was done on everybody who walked in the hospital. I speak to res psychiatric residents and they've never done a B12 test. They've never done a folate test. Okay, and I, I can, I can I'm trying to think of the term, but I, I think the biggest tragedy in, in modern medicine with mental health is not aggressively treating B12 deficiency. So I saw a kid today, uh, multiple trials of antidepressants, depressed, anxious, panic attacks, and had a dramatically low B12 level. B12, the med low B12, the medications don't work as well. You can have symptoms from fatigue to anxiety to paranoia. The intervention is relatively simple. It's usually injections of B12, but it's a treatable cause of those list of symptoms in the DSM-5 that says you have depression. But you have to test for it to understand it. And the, the interesting thing about B12 is the symptoms really vary, and you can have physical symptoms and or psychological symptoms. It was nice when a study was published um, a few years ago looking at treatment refractory depression. We see this every day. It's probably the most common thing I see, but you know it's rare that I get a research study that demonstrates failed to respond to three trials of antidepressants, low B12, three to four weeks improvement in depressed mood. Okay, how about our low fat, no fat, skinny, mini, what a light. I mean, how much, because I, I grew up on Fresca and Tab, right? So we, my generation started at how much has this done for our obesity epidemic? Not much, right? The numbers are getting worse. And, and part of what I will share with you today, which is nice news, is it's, it's getting to be common knowledge, is this has had profound effects in our mental health. Okay, In my world of treating very severe anorexics, I actually see anorexia nervosa as a fat deficiency disorder. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but all mental health problems, um, I believe, can be related to fat deficiency. The brain is 60% fat. Low-fat diets don't work. I eat fish every day and my butt still drags on the ground. <laughs> and we've been obsessed with this low-fat diet and we have not had much success in anywhere in terms of our um, treatment. So what's pretty scary, although now it's um, at the forefront of our medical knowledge, for 30 years, we've been obsessed with fat and cholesterol as causing heart disease. Well, this was a study done in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1989. And yes, it was true as cholesterol levels went down, right? So cholesterol levels went down over here. So we say, that's good. And then the study said, oh yeah, there was less heart attacks. That's good too. But the overall death rate was almost double. Okay, how many people have read the Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Newsweek or whatever the magazine about high, low fat is not the answer, right? The big spread about maybe we should eat butter. Well, it's pretty clear that monosaturated, saturated, and polyunsaturated fats are important for brain function. And one of these wonderful hidden secrets in, in modern uh, psychiatry is that low cholesterol, I believe, is one of the most malignant, difficult to treat um, blood tests in, in our very ill patients. Low cholesterol has been associated, besides cancer and um, stroke, but depression and suicide, particularly the aggressive um, self-injury suicide. We can take uh, victims, motorcycle accident victims, and compare their brains from suicide victims dramatically lower 
fat and cholesterol in the suicide victims. And what we're also seeing anxiety, OCD, and those kids that tend to be, you know, literally addicted to the pot, the kids that feel better smoking pot, have these very, very low levels of fat in the brain. How many people have heard of fish oil? How many people think it helps depression? A few. Well, it's certainly critically important for brain function. And there are many individuals that are deficient in these omega-3 fatty acids. But part of the work that we're doing is that there are many depressed patients that aren't deficient in these omega-3 fatty acids. And it's not always the best thing to just say, take fish oil. Just like we don't want to say, take Prozac. But we can, we can test, we can understand who is low in omega-3 fatty acids. Typically, these individuals are low in, in vitamin D and other fat-soluble nutrients. But the omega-3 fatty acids has been shown to be correlated with mood disorders. And then the question is, well, what do you take, right? And I, I think there's lots of hype out there. The uh, nutraceutical industry is not regulated. They can market anything. They can say anything. And you also don't know what's in the vitamin bottle, right? Have you read those stories from New York? The, um, you know, they looked at 10 different supplements, Walgreens, Target, and they all had completely different um, amount of material, the, the, the herbs they studied, where they looked at than what was on the bottle. So there's no regulation like they do for pharmaceutical companies. So you need to be careful. Um, and here's just a, a study looking at adding these omega-3s to the antidepressants. Oh, thank you. I couldn't turn the bottle Okay, so the problem is our patients read because it says it on Newsweek or Time that you should eat fish oil. So they run to the health food store and they take fish oil for a couple weeks. I don't feel any better. So they throw it away. Well, number one, there's an expression that says it takes three months to change your oil. Okay? To get these healthy fats into your cells, it's at least three months. This one, this one study looked at 10 weeks for these healthy fats to be incorporated into the membranes in the brain. So a big controversy or a big problem out there is the kind of misinformation, getting information from a 16-year-old at the health food store about what to, how what to take and how to take. It's amazing to me. How if you go to a health food store and you just listen to these clerks and, and someone's there just nodding and saying, oh, OK, as if they have this secret knowledge. But it's a little frightening, but it takes time, and you need to understand. So it takes at least three months if somebody is deficient. So the punchline for all the fat information, I think this is just a, a brilliant concept. By modifying the natural fats, we've altered the basic building blocks of the human brain, weakening cerebral architecture like unstable buildings that come apart in an earthquake, storm, Poorly structured human brains are failing to cope with the mounting stress of modern life. So for those of you who do work with eating disorder patients, think of um, our fat phobic uh, patients who might not have eaten any fat for 15, 20, or 30 years and begin to kind of make sense as to why um, things are so hard for them. Okay, so I think I have a lot more information than you're going to need to know. So let me just talk about one more, which is exclude, right? And we're going to get to the fun part, right? How many people have been to a party or been at work and sat around the table and someone has not talked about gluten-free, <laughs> right? Their friend, their relative, their buddy, their husband, their spouse, they've tried it and they feel great. And I always love these stories because then, you know, a month later, you know, you ask them, or don't ask them, but you overhear that they're not gluten-free anymore. So we have this weedophobia is a term that I heard. And it's just really kind of taking over. It's a little overdone, but there are certainly many reasons why we might, again, 
Remember our 10 individuals that are 36, year old, 36 years of age who are depressed? Well, one of them might have a problem with gluten, right? Because celiac disease, how many people know what celiac disease is? Right, so this autoimmune disorder where the protein in wheat, gluten, our body develops this immune response to it. And we have much, much higher risk of depression. And it's not tested for in our kids. And oftentimes, the first symptoms are what we call non-GI, fatigue and depression. So they don't always walk into your office with having GI problems, fatigue or depression. And for me, it's just a no, nice marker of everything that I talk about. If you're celiac and you destroy your intestine by eating gluten, you're not able to absorb nutrients. Right? And what are these nutrients? They look familiar? We talked a little bit about essential fatty acids. We talked a little bit about omega-3. We should put amino acids. They're, they're malnourished. Their brain doesn't work as well. Much, much higher incidence of depression. And here, the fun part about the last five years of my life um, is everything I've been trying to say for the past 25 years of my life. Now I can use words like double-blind placebo-controlled trial or the American Journal of Psychiatry. So here, American Journal of Psychiatry, a couple months ago, this has been unheard of, published improvement in psychotic symptoms after a gluten-free diet. Okay, I can't tell you what my colleagues um, thought when I talked about gluten-free diets in um, 20 years ago. Or I'll, I'll quickly tell you one story. I was doing um, a covering for vacation at Westwood Lodge, you know, this, uh, the inpatient unit. So the, the chief of psychiatry at the time brought me into the office. And he said, you're not going to prescribe vitamins, are you? I said, no, I will not prescribe vitamins. Um, this was unheard of years ago, but it's now um, getting a lot of press and research because the food that we eat does affect who we are. Now, the last big category in our zebra approach is restore, and we're going to talk about the gut bacteria, right? How many people have been reading about how important the healthy bacteria or our commercials, right? About eat our yogurt? Well, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, we have 10 times more microorganisms than cells in our human body, which if that's not impressive, the most dramatic thing to me is the number of microbial genes. Okay, the genes in our body, the microbial genes outnumber us 150 to 1. So we are more microbe than we are human, right? Three million, over 3 million genes to 22,000 human genes. It's a little scary when you think about it. And no two people share the same gut bacteria, just like we don't share the same metabolism and or fingerprints. So over the years, I'm not going to go through these, but we have um, clear research demonstrating the gut bacteria affects our mood. Here, let me just start with this slide. Remember these neurotransmitters? Well, the different flora, the different bacteria in our gut can affect all the same neurotransmitters that our medications can or changes in our diet can. Here's the serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine again, just by changing the bacteria in the gut. So another test that we do on every depre depressed patient that walks in the office is we look at what microbes they have in the gut. Some of these microbes produce chemicals that create anxiety, depression, agitation. You heard of candida, right? How many people have been around? It was around 20 years ago when candida caused everything on the planet. Well, it's not that good, but it can impair appetite and mood. So we test for candida. Again, dysbiosis, problems in the GI in the GI system, the gut can affect our behavior. And then um, we really think about changing personality. Here's a fun study looking at um, eight-week-old mice. And we took the bacteria 
from the young mice that were timid into the guts of the mice that were risk takers, and their personalities changed. So, so be careful, fecal transplants are on the horizon. And um, it's actually our most effective um, treatment for um, you know, uh, C. difficile. OK, an integrative treatment is not all B12 in biology, although it's the core part of what we do. Um, we know a couple things. We know our faith and uh, having a sense of spirituality is profoundly important. One, decreasing the onset of depression, better response to antidepressants, OK? Um, and then how many people are doing their mindful moments every day, whether it's their yoga or their meditation. So really profound effects on brain chemistry by simple um, meditative mindfulness practices. And you know, some people have known this for, for centuries, but now we have these kind of research articles to say, oh, guess what? It's critically important for brain function, particularly for the treatment of depression. I was going to get up early to go running, but my toes voted against me 10 to 1. <laughs> Depression, exercise. There is not a better antidepressant, right? There's not a medication that works as well as exercise, based on the research. But what I don't understand, treating depression for 30 years, I don't know how they get these individuals who are depressed to do these research studies. Because my depressed patients, you know, could write a book on the importance of exercise, but they're not necessarily going to the gym or walking around the block. So we know exercise is critical. It certainly can help maintain our mood. There's lots of chemicals and hormones that change when we exercise. But most of the individuals struggling with serious depression likely need other interventions, be it nutritional or medical, to get to that point. But it is critically important. So I guess I could have just kept this slide up for the entire time. I hope um, you can appreciate the fact that depression is not a Prozac deficiency. It's more complicated, but an integrative approach begins to gather some of the tools, not all of them, to be able to ascertain what's going on. When, when you leave the room, you're going to have to sign a statement saying you'll never use the word alternative medicine when we're talking about the treatment of depression. Because we, this can't be alternative, right? Alternative means it's something different. And, and this has to be integrated. It has to be part of what we do. It's how we help our patients, how we help our family members. We need to make sure we get vitamin D levels and B12 levels, and that we understand the importance of exercise, mindfulness, and spirituality. It's not alternative. Promise? OK. So integrative psychiatry. We look at the unique individual, the whole patient, not this disease, the interconnections of the body and mind. Sometimes our colleagues forget there's a neck connecting the body with the mind. Restore health instead of just reducing symptoms. We're looking at underlying root causes. And oftentimes, it comes down to this concept of, of nutrient reserves and our genetic ability and need for perhaps higher levels of nutrients. So these are just a few slides I've been using for 100 years to, because they're just so impressive to me, I thought I would share them with you. These are adult prisoners, 231 prisoners, OK? This was in London. They received a multivitamin, and this was an over-the-counter multivitamin that was you could buy in the drugstore in, in London, and an essential fatty acid supplement, two pills. And they took them for four months. By just, it was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial they were in the same prison, ate the same food, had the same routine, and nobody knew who was getting what. OK? And in those four months, those that took this multivitamin and these essential fatty acids, 26% fewer offenses, OK? And 35.1 reduction um, in offenses. These are violent offenses and aggressive behaviors. Think a multivitamin, no testing, no mega doses, no understanding the unique personal genetic profile, just taking essential fatty acid and a multivitamin. Think of the public health implications. 
So integrative work, we, we look at mental illness. Tonight we focused on depression, and we just took a little snippet of depression. We used to give these eight-hour full-day seminars and, and still didn't cover everything. But we just kind of, and I apologize for going quickly over lots of things, but I wanted to give you a, a snippet of what this might look like. Errors in physiology. Maybe there's one, maybe there's two, maybe there's six. But if we find the cause, then we can start using words like cure and remission. I gave a talk for a uh, supplement company. It was a webinar. And I had something like this, because it was a celiac disease case, a patient. And I used the word depression was cured. Right? Because I treated his celiac disease, we gave him his nutrients, he wasn't depressed anymore. To me, that's a cure. And the lawyers for the supplement company said we couldn't use the slide. Because you couldn't talk about cure for, for mental illness or depression, because they, they might get sued. But, but here we have a model. Prozac doesn't give us a model, because oftentimes you stop the Prozac and, and the symptoms come back and the withdrawal could be really bad. It is a symptomatic relief and for some individuals, life-saving symptomatic relief. But the integrative approach, we look at cause and we might get cure. So if you walk into our offices in Hingham or Waltham or anywhere, we're going to test for everything. When I started this in 1993 with Lance, um, you know, we would pick and choose a few tests and I tried to save people money, but I missed things. And, and over the years, I, I just look for everything. It's been incredibly helpful because I can't predict who's going to be deficient in vitamin D and who might have high levels of mercury. And the, when we started, it was $2,000 battery. Now I think it's $165. So it's now reasonable for most people. So why, when I talk to patients and I, I share them some of this information, they say this is common sense. Why didn't Dr. X say this or Dr. Y? And uh, it's getting better. It's clearly getting better than 20 years ago. But I think there is a, a difficulty in our, particularly our mental health professional. And the tomato effect is one way that I describe this. And this was an article written by two physicians, 1984. And, the rejection of highly efficacious treatments. Why is it so hard for our medical colleagues to accept things that work? And the tomato effect, the theory that this article was written about, is based on the fact that for hundreds of years in this country, we would not eat tomatoes, right? When we came over 1600, we would not eat tomatoes. Why? They were poison, right? It's part of the nightshade family. You would die if you ate tomatoes. Even though we knew that they were eating tomatoes in Europe and having a great time. And it was uh, Salem, New Jersey, that somebody stood up in 1820 with a basket of tomatoes. It's a true story. And he ate the tomatoes. He didn't die. And we've been eating tomatoes ever since. But the kind of the norm, the culture, was that tomatoes were poisonous. And our culture, our medical culture, it is so bizarre for me um, to listen to, but it is something simple like a nutritional intervention cannot treat major mental illness. Okay? They, they ask a group of cardiologists about vitamin E. And um, this is a, a cardiology convention. And they, the, someone said, how many people in the group recommend vitamin E for their patients? And nobody raised their hand because it wasn't a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And then they asked, how many people take vitamin E? And three-quarters of the room raised their hand. Okay? They would take it, but they wouldn't because it's not acceptable crap. So that's a tomato effect. So here I'm going to end with the, the kind of information that we have with nutrition. Um, the Japanese eat very little fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the British in America. The French eat a lot of fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the British and Americans. The Japanese drink very little wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the British and Americans. And the Italians drink excessive red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the British and Americans. And then our Germans are drinking beer and sausage, lots of fat, 
but they also suffer fewer heart attacks than the British or Americans. So the state of our nutrition information is such where eat and drink what you like, speaking English <laughs> is, is apparently what kills you. So we got time for questions. Uh, so maybe you could repeat. So the question is, if you had a good nutritional foundation, why would you need an antidepressant? Yeah, yeah. Is there a case where there are benefits also have? There's absolutely a case, and, and you know, the punchline is that we want the person in front of us, we want our patients, we want you to, to not be depressed and feel better. And oftentimes, we can do it with this integrative approach, looking at the cause. Sometimes we can do it with a simple pill. Most of the time, my world is integrative, doing it with both. But you could be eating the best diet in the world, like Marsha, and you know, doing every exercise and teaching your yoga classes and still struggle with depression. And I'm gonna come back to genes and that genetic vulnerability is profound and we can't get away from it. And so there are individuals, particularly with, with cyclical mood disorders, that could have this overwhelming depressed mood and would need a mood stabilizer or medication. So again, everyone's different, and the perfect diet is not always the answer. Okay. Yeah, have you heard of the 23andMe? I think it's $99. It's um, actually most of the other genetic tests are, are a little cheaper. So they, they, they do many, many, many genes. The FDA kind of didn't quite shut them down, but had them stop providing health information because they would start telling people this gene, you could get kidney disease, this gene, you might get Alzheimer's. And um, so the FDA kind of put a damper on that. Um, so there are, if, with a helpful interpretation by a professional, it's the same genes as the other tests are looking for. So if you look at the MTHFR, the COMP gene, um, my concern, particularly with a lot of anxious OCD individuals, looking and reading information about genes and panicking. So I, I prefer the genetic testing be done by a physician, a nurse practitioner, someone who's gonna help you interpret what that really means. But, but 20, it's the same, your genes aren't gonna change. So 23andMe is, it do, does a lot, of, a lot of the same tests. Well, I don't know exactly in relation to serotonin, but we certainly know that the, all the research on dieting and studies, and, and people end up gaining weight and has not been shown to be effective for kind of weight loss. So there's profound effects on the neurotransmitters, not just serotonin, with many of these artificial sweeteners. Yes? Yes, there, there are a number of um, individuals in the community, some naturopaths and some physicians that are kind of uh, recommend, excuse me, to cancer patients to take X, Y, and Z. Take selenium, take magnesium, take vitamin C. And, and the cancer patients that we've seen, it's just not that simple. So again, looking at these individual tests, we've seen tremendous variation in some of these deficiencies and treating them individually has been incredibly helpful. The most, um, I think one of the most important things 
that we have um, learned for some of the cognitive changes with chemotherapy, which is a whole other lecture and discussion, is the use of the low-dose lithium um, to prevent some of the cognitive decline. So nutritional lithium, very, very low dose, can prevent some of the um, cognitive changes, the neuronal destruction from, from chemo and radiation. Absolutely. So this gen genetics, you know, they're not, it's not our destiny. So we, um, because then we would kind of all give up, right? You know, um, but it's just kind of a liability. So if our parent had diabetes, our parent had breast cancer, we, we might, we have that liability, but we can change that. But any of these environmental insults like chemo or radiation, the biggest being stress, you know, it's called epigenetics. It's affecting the expression of certain genes, okay? Our genes aren't changing, but the expression of those genes can change, and certainly chemo and radiation and cancer treatment can. In terms of, uh, the question. Everyone had the question. The question is, what's happening to our kids? Um, and all I can say, and anybody who's a clinician here, um, every illness that I treated 30 years ago is starting younger, and and more. The pathology is more severe the increase in suicidality, increase in eating disorders, increase in the onset of depression and mood disorders are, are just increasing and we're seeing at a younger age. Part of it, um, I, I think, has to be diet. You know, part of it has to be the environment. Um, so big studies came out in the last few weeks. You know, I don't know why they spent $2 million, but air pollution affects behavior in kids. Um, heavy metals, lead, copper, so clearly environmental factors, nutritional factors, um, and stress factors are playing a role, and these kids are getting um, uh, sicker at much younger ages. And, and I also think, I do have to pick on psychiatrists one last time, is I think our aggressive use of medications in these young kids are creating more problems. So putting some of these four and five-year-olds on antidepressants and antipsychotics have to wreak havoc on the developmental brain, right? Our, our brains continue, neurotransmitter systems I talked about develop, they stop women are a little quicker, about eight, age 18, and men up to 21 to 25. So adding some of these very significant uh, psychotropic medications has to affect the course of these illnesses. So why don't we stop? I'll be around if there are other questions. I appreciate your time and patience.